Hi, I'm Sam Weeb, and you're listening to the Strategic Authorpreneur Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about crime and detective fiction. Hey there, Strategic Authorpreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We're here to help you save time, money, and energy as you level up your writing career. Welcome to episode 36 of the Strategic Authorpreneur Podcast. On today's show, we're talking with author Sam Weeb about writing crime and detective fiction. But first, what have you been up to this week, Michele? So the book that I would like to suggest to you this week is uh, a bit different from the usual. And uh, the, na- the title of the book is Start With Why. Uh, how great leaders inspire everyone to take action from Simon Sinek and you can see kind of the cover if you are watching it on uh, YouTube now why did I say that it's a bit different because I read this book uh, some time ago and it was suggested uh, to me uh, by a couple of different people and I didn't really know what to expect uh, by this book I thought it might have been on the motiv- motivational side um, which uh, I was looking forward to read something motivational, uh, but it turned out to be slightly different. Uh, so Simon, Simon uh, Sinek, uh, it's also like a speaker. Uh, but what's interesting for this book, at least for me, uh, and that uh, really made me think of a few possibilities that I've never really thought about, was that this start with why, um, it's basically presenting an idea that I've never really elaborated on. And it's more on the idea that the great leaders, but also great companies, like he quote in the book, uh, Apple, for example, um, they inspire others uh, by putting the why, which is basically the purpose, uh, before the how and the what. And how would be the process and the what would be the product. And I never really thought of a person or a company in these terms. I never thought of the why and the what and the how. The thing that makes, for me, this book very interesting is the approach that he uses. And I think us, Crystal, as entrepreneurs, we, we can use that for branding. Um, the why of the product that we are releasing to the person can be, mine can be different from yours. The process we use, it might be similar, but I think if there is, the why would be for me the heart, uh, but more on a businessy kind of term, not just uh, uh, any kind of term. So I really thought that this book was interesting because well, it was enlightening me in a way that I never seen before possible, how to see a product, a company, or a person, in this case, a leaders, from a very different point of view the point of view of the why, and then the how, and then the what. So if you're thinking of uh, leveling up your understanding uh, under that point of view, and you want to explore this different way of approaching the world, really, and uh, the way also, I would say, art, uh, some kind of arts are created, I would definitely suggest you to go uh, check uh, um, Start With Why by Simon. So that was the book of the, of the week for me. And I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, we're going to get uh, you the title and uh, subtitles, uh, everything uh, on the resource section. So if you're interested, you can click and uh, buy it. And uh, regarding what I've been up to, um, Krista, I've been really trying to understand uh, from the data that I gathered in the last five to six months on Amazon ads, where do I want to go from this point on? So I've learned a few things uh, by using those, uh, and I'm not really sure where to go from this point on. Hence why we had a lovely conversation uh, some time ago about uh, how to use them and how to scale them. And that's something that I have to say a bit scares me to scale Amazon ads or ads in general, because it's really the very first time that I'm doing this more on on a serious uh, scale. Uh, using Amazon on a using ads actually on a consistent basis, months after months after months, 
And we've been lucky in the sense that we actually had some good results, uh, not amazing, but good results. And I just want to do double down on, on those and see if we can go further, faster <laughs> with this, uh, with this, um, um, with this new venue, uh, if you will. So I'm very excited. I'm trying to study a bit more on how to use those. And uh, hopefully in the next three to four months, I'm going to have a, you know, a bit more, more of a data to see what's working and not. But I'll definitely keep you updated. Uh, so stay in the journey. And what about your journey, Krista? What have you been up to in this past uh, seven days? Well, the big excitement was that I finished my journal. So I got to have a new journal book, which is always exciting. They didn't have the kind I usually get, actually. So I got this one with some elephants. And it says, when you love what you have, you have everything you need. And I am just going through and basically simplifying my life at the moment and reducing all like the monthly expenses as much as I can as I'm making a shift into being a full-time author and I've kind of downsized all of my consulting business and gotten rid of a lot of that side of things. A lot of the things I was subscribing to were business expenses that made sense when I was doing client work for dozens of people or hundreds of people and keeping all of that stuff straight. But as a single solopreneur author, um, it doesn't make sense to maintain all of that stuff and be committed to monthly expenditures. So I went through all of my books as I'm doing the, the sort of closing out for the end of the year of the business and just cleaning everything up. And that was a really good chance to just reflect on basically as you go through line by line in your credit card expenses and double check everything from the year and do all the reconciliations, it's good to get a really solid financial picture of what's happening where and what that all looks like. And um, as part of preparing for that shift and making that shift, I have been reading Atomic Habits, which so you can see by the fact that there's like 57 post-it notes in it. And I have scribbled on it and highlighted things all over the place. That is one of my favorite books on habits and really helpful when it comes to making yourself a new lifestyle. So lots of really good advice in there, but there's two pieces that I found particularly helpful. They're just sets of questions that he asks. And James Clear is the guy who wrote the book and he talks about two times a year doing a bit of a review for his business. And in the new year, he usually sits down and asks himself three questions, which is what went well this year? What didn't go so well this year? And what did I learn from, from whatever happened? And so those are three really great questions, which I've been doing some journaling, my shiny new journal about. Um, and then he also does something which I thought was really interesting and which he calls an integrity report, which is he asks himself, what are the core values that drive his life and work? Uh, how am I living and working with integrity right now? And how can I set a higher standard in the future? So I've also been working through those questions. And I think as I sort of realign my business focus and move forward, I really want to make sure that I'm doing so completely in line with what I believe in and making sure that, you know, the channels I'm choosing and the approach I'm taking to the writing and publishing process all lines up with that. And of course, building a more regular writing habit. I have historically been great at like what I call binge writing, which is just get, I get in the zone and then I might write 10,000 words a day for several days. And I just keep going basically until the book is finished, but that isn't very sustainable long-term. So even though it pains me a little to approach change, I am going to have to actually shift so that I am writing more often, more regularly, and not burning myself out with each project, basically, because that's what happens when you go too hard for too long. 
Um, and I do have an assistant coming on to help me, which means that I have to be providing stable output in order for her to have consistent job duties throughout the year as well. And so that is an extra bit of motivation to really shake things up and make those changes. So for me, that has been a, a week of thinking, pondering, reinventing, and just trying to get everything all aligned for this next part of the adventure. But I had a really fascinating conversation with Sam Weeb about writing crime and detective fiction. So I think we should go listen to that. And then we'll be back at the end to talk about what we heard, break it all down for you as always. And just before we go, if you want to buy us a coffee to contribute a little bit to the cost of the podcast, the coffee is a metaphorical thing. We're all writers. We get that. The buy me a coffee button on our website, we probably won't actually spend on coffee because I don't think either of us drink it, but we will put it towards hosting for the website and we'll put it towards paying for the podcast distribution and and the transcription costs and things like that. So for anyone who has hit that button already, thank you so much. And if you haven't, it is at strategicauthorpreneur.com, right in the sidebar on the front page. You can just give it a click and see what happens when you do. It's a pretty cool tool, actually. And so if you're looking for ways to fund your own creative endeavors, you can also check it out as a little bit of a research experiment and see how it works. And it might be something that could help you fund your own creative projects as well. Now on to Sam we go. Okay. So we are here with crime fiction writer, Sam Weeb, and we are going to be digging into the gritty world of the dark side of things a little bit and learning a little bit about what your writing process is like and how, how you became a writer and what that journey looks like. But first, I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about what brought you to being a writer in the first place. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's one of those things where I always wanted to be a writer. I always read voraciously and, um, you know, I, I had done a bunch of terrible, you know, stories and stuff, uh, earlier in life, but in, in, uh, in grad school or as I was starting grad school, I just had this feeling of put up or shut up. Like this is the moment to actually you know, put all of my effort into getting good at this and try to get published and, and, or, or just give it up completely because that sort of like half in half out was just driving me crazy. So uh, I, I really worked at it, wrote a novel that didn't go anywhere and then wrote uh, the book that became last of the independence, which was the first one that I had published. And, um, and it's been smooth sailing from there. <laughs> Not, <laughs> Nary <laughs> yes, <laughs> as most writers' journeys, they are not, uh, you know, that moment where you just sort of coast to the top of the hill and then crest smoothly off to your destination. Yes. Um, so you said grad school. Did you go to school for writing or was it something else that you did in your background? Um, I did a, uh, a, a bachelor's of English and history and then I did... Um, a master's of English, and I wanted originally to be a technical writer. I thought I would hate teaching and just love writing manuals or something, but um, I actually really like teaching, so um, I, I pursued that, and um, I, I really like the literature side. I just never could, um, I, I never had the money for like a creative writing MFA, and I never had the, um, you know, like I always wanted sort of a a, a job out of it rather than just teaching creative writing. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, and what was it that sort of <coughs> sent you into crime fiction in particular? I mean, I know you have some other stuff as well, um, but that seemed to be sort of one of the highlights at the moment. So where does that passion come from for murder and mayhem? Yeah, it's, it's funny. Like I, I loved crime fiction before I knew I loved crime fiction. I just assumed I was the kind of person who read everything because I did. I mean, I loved lit fic and, um, 
you know, I used to read like Westerns and weird historical books and true crime, like just, you know, across the board. But um, there was a moment when I was about 25 or so where I just remember looking at my bookshelf and it was all like Elmore Leonard crime novels, Sue Grafton detective novels and stuff like that. And just being like, oh, okay, I guess this is, this is what I'm into. Huh. And um, very shortly after that, my writing just went the same way. And it was just almost admitting like, look, of all these great options, this is the one that you care about. This is the one that, um, you know, when I was a little kid, I loved Encyclopedia Brown and the Hardy Boys and all those kind of stories. And then gravitated to my parents, um, you know, detective novels like John D. McDonald's, uh, his series and like Dashiell Hammett and stuff. So, and then just really... Um, you know, had had to have that moment of being like, oh, okay, this is actually what you want to focus on. And, um, you know, that it, it actually clarified things and made it easier. Um, I have definitely done stuff that's not, not in there, but I've also done stuff where I've started out being like, I'm going to write a great lit novel and 10 pages in there's a body and a cover up and guilt <laughs> and, and you're just like, yeah, okay, this is, <laughs> I guess I know what I like to do. And that's, I think that's a really important thing to acknowledge is so many people, you know, will have such a strong passion for one particular genre that is all they read and they just consume that all the time. And yet they don't give themselves permission to actually write in that genre. I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with, but, you know, as you said, the path is not always a smooth one. And so if we are doing something we really love and immersing ourselves in it and, and hustling to make a career over a long period of time, it's going to be so much easier if you are really in an area of passion where you, you have internalized so many of those story arcs and everything as well. That, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your Wakeland st stories? I know like you've got a couple different novels that are in that same series and just kind of for those who haven't read them, just a glimpse into what kind of detective uh, you've got and, and sort of setting and things like that. Yeah. Um, Dave Wakeland is a Vancouver based private detective and he and his partner, Jeff Chen, uh, mainly handle a combination of missing persons cases uh, because that's Dave's passion and very high-end corporate cases because that's what Jeff uh, can make money off. So uh, most of the books take uh, focus around a missing persons investigation that spirals into murder and conspiracy and all that great stuff. Um, I, I like to think of them as you know, like what Raymond Chandler or, or uh, Dashiell Hammett would be writing if they were writing now. Like it's that sort of, um, I guess you call it like a literary detective novel. It's very much about the city and the social um, issues that are going on. And, um, you know, really trying to just capture how I look at Vancouver and the sort of disjunction between the very public tourist friendly face of Vancouver and then what what I think is really going on. We have a lot of uh, grit and interesting kind of history and and subcultures in the city here. It's very, very interesting. There's lots of stuff going on that people are really, if you're not tuned into or not paying attention, just, just have no idea that that's what's going on. Um, when it comes to sort of developing those ideas that come at you into a novel, what does that process look like for you? Are you a plotter or a panzer or uh, how do you approach the, the writing journey? Um, I, I usually have some idea. Um, it might be just a loose outline or a series of beats that I know I'm going to hit. Um, I mean, I, I don't really like plotter and panzer as terms, but there's, there's one called plotzer, which is in the middle which I, I hate even more, but I also feel like, yeah, that's kind of how I do it. Um, so I, I try to have an idea, um, maybe not so much, uh, you know, what's going to happen in, on every page, but, uh, you know, the logical development of the, the plot, the clues and things like that. I, I do tend to work out a little bit of that early. And then um, also like what I want to 
build to? Like, w- what's the climax of this book going to be? What's the moment that's going to, you know, that, that this is all really going to hang on? And um, so I try to build back from there a little bit. But it's, it's very much, uh, you know, whatever happens on that day or in my life, it, it kind of ends up in the books too. So, yeah. I am with you on the not loving the terms. Um, I usually go with discovery writer where, you know, you sort of have a framework and then you're learning the characters and you're learning the story and it's kind of getting, getting born as you're going through the process of creation. And I, I love that, that there's pieces of, you know, whatever happens in your day that ends up in your work. Um, how how do you handle fictionalizing some real inspirational things? Like for people who are maybe newer to this and worried about putting too much reality into their books, what are some tips that they could maybe balance a little bit of that? Well, um, I mean, I do I do a lot of research and a lot of talking to people. Um, I mean, t- to me, the main thing is like I, I want people to get a sense of Vancouver. So if I have to change a couple of names of things to convey that sense accurately, I think that that's a smart move and it's a good uh, dramatic move. Um, so, you know, if there's a restaurant that I really like, I want to include it or, or a bar that, you know, Wakeland ends up going to, I, I want to include it. But, you know, if it's, if it's, if I'm going to say that it's owned by like, you know, some sort of biker gang and there's like, you know, horrible things happening there. Like I, I don't want to, you know, COVID is closing enough cool restaurants. I don't want to like add to that. So I'll just, um, you know, change the name a little bit. Um, but most people who live here are like, oh yeah, that's, that's that one. Or, you know, um, and then there's also just the fact that places close just because of gentrification. So by the time the book comes out, there are places that are gone anyway. So nobody needs to, to worry about offending the, uh, you know, the owner of the Mountain Shadow Pub because sadly it's not here anymore. Um, yes. Yeah, and then I just, remember that one. <laughs> love it. Um, and and then just with people, it's the same thing. Like you know, trying not to. You know, I I don't try to draw from like you know any one person. It's more just like getting a sense of who the characters are, and you know, finding my way to relate to them. So, you know, sadly, any character probably has a little bit more of me than than any you know one person. And do you ever have trouble getting yourself to sit down and write? Or is that something that uh, just comes? I know that's always a, a, the motivation piece is always an interesting thing to look at because every writer kind of has their different strategies or different sticking points. Yeah, I try to, um, I try to do it first thing. I have a pretty good schedule most of the time where um, my girlfriend is an electrician, so she leaves really early in the morning, like, you know, quarter to five. And I don't start teaching until noon, so I have that chunk of time to do prep, but also do a couple hours of writing. And I set goals, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty disciplined when it comes to um, – to making the time sometimes what you write sucks though and it's just this agony of you know i'm putting in my thousand words and i'm sitting here and it's just not coming well um there's a great tip by raymond chandler where he said like just block off a period of time and you don't have to write but don't let yourself do anything else and by that you're just like okay like if i'm not playing solitaire or whatever like Either I'm going to get some work done or I'm going to sit here very unhappy, but either way, it's going to be, you know, more productive than just giving into the distractions. Yeah. If you're sitting there anyway, you might as well be trying to generate some words, even if they're not great, it will keep you entertained for sure. Now from all your teaching and you were the writer in residence at the VPL as well, what did you learn from working with other writers or what did you find were some common things that, that were sort of people were having challenges with? Um, I I think that the most common thing that I've seen with, um, with writers of all ages is having really cool experiences and then not 
being able to translate them into dramatic terms. So, uh, you know, there's someone I'm working with where their background is like high finance and they want to do like a John Grisham thriller. And I'm like, yeah, this is really cool. But, um, you know, that writer will describe, you know, what, uh, you know, so, some like term and it's just like a page of, you know, technical jargon. So you're like, okay, no, like you actually have to, you know, reverse engineer this. So, you know, create a character who doesn't know the term and then have somebody explain them and be funny and be, you know, cutting and show their different personalities. And so it's, it's really working, um, you know, like to, to take what people have, uh, lived through or what they're interested in, what their passion is, and then finding ways to turn that into effective stories. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Especially to do it well. <laughs> um, so if someone is looking to better their craft, do you have any favorite go-to resource books or websites or courses that you uh, like to send people to? Yeah. I mean, all the, all the standard, um, I mean, Stephen King's on writing is great. Um, uh, I teach at Humber now, and um, their course book is by uh, Jane Burroway, and that's very that one that book's very good. Um, David Mamet has a couple of really great drama books. Um, one's called Three Uses of the Knife, which is just about structure, but it's not a it's not like a save the cat. Like here's what you do on page five, here's what you do on page ten. It's like what's the purpose of an introduction, or what's the purpose of a act two how come when i get to act two i feel really like de-energized as a person like what's what's going on there and how does that mirror what the characters are going through so i mean that's that's a real favorite of mine um but i mean like they're all they're all great i i just love um like well-written books about writing like i love the william goldman uh adventures in the screen trade book um and which lie did i tell just because they're, it's fun to just hear you know he just has such a great voice so yeah, I mean, you can kind of learn from from all of those. And I'm curious, so did you ever think of going indie? I mean, you went kind of the traditional route, right? And was there any point in the process where you thought, oh, should I do this myself? Or was that kind of a, a straight shot for you? Um, I, I have more of a appreciation for indie authors now because I know what... Um, I mean, I, I think that what I love about that approach is that you actually learn every part of the book publishing process. Like, I don't know anything about marketing because, you know, I've had people market books for me and some of them have been wonderful and some of them have been terrible, but I don't have those skills. So, you know, for, for me coming from traditional publishing, like I have to work on all those things. So I actually look up to, uh, to indie writers a lot. I think, um, they get a bad rap and, and some of it can be very, uh, I mean, there's a lot of sloppy writing out there across the board, but, um, you know, there's a lot of indie writers where like they hire good editors and they get good covers and they really care. And it's, uh, it's about control and it's about kind of having, you know, like I want this to look this way. So when the reader, you know, picks this up, it has this feel and this, this, uh, you know, typeface and, uh, you know, I, I really respect that. But not tempted yourself, which is, I think, useful uh, information as a writer to know kind of where your skill sets are and where your preferences are. And um, if that allows the focus, I think you're already, you said you're teaching as well as writing. So there's already two jobs on your plate uh, in combination. So how do you balance those two things? Um, cool. Uh, just before we leave that, I, I did um, I did put out a short story recently through my newsletter where I edited and formatted and did the cover myself. Um, so like I and I and I've done a lot of research on that. So I I have been studying indie publishing just in the idea that you know if this doesn't work out or if I get a feeling of like oh I could do this better, you know I I love that uh, that thing. So. No, it hasn't tempted me yet, but I'm I'm very, very close to it. Um, 
I mean, I, I don't know about the balance. Like it's, um, it, it varies by my bank account really. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and do you find there are different seasons in the year like is the teaching consistent all year round or do you have sort of chunks of time where it's more one or more the other well i i um i do teach uh three semesters a year um so that's pretty consistent um you know this there's a little bit more time off in the summer and then the fall is where there's all the literary events. So, uh, you know, time tends to get more precious in the, in the fall, but, um, you know, like it's, it, it really, really varies project to project when I'm writing a novel, like I need all those days in the morning to just sort of get the first draft and then edit it. And how long does it take you usually to do a first draft? Like, is that a, a consistent kind of process for you? Or do you have a, a timeline on those things? Um, I, I try to, I mean, you know, it, it gestates for months and months. But um, once I start working on the first draft, I try to get a thousand words a minimum uh, a day. Uh, sometimes I'll take off weekends and a lot of the times I'll, I'll get uh, more so I budget about three months for the rough draft. And, you know, sometimes that is woefully optimistic and it takes five months or six months. Um, but that's just to get the first draft. And then it's about the same amount of time to edit. And I like to do three or four passes through it. So it's about a year until I have something that, like, I'm happy sharing with people. Nice. Um... Okay, here's a question for you. If you were going back to give yourself advice 20 years ago, what advice would you give to yourself to help make this path a little easier? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> time machine. You got to hop in a time machine and off you go. You know, I think um, not worrying so much about um like literary aspirations and that sort of idea of like oh if you're a literary writer you're going to be looked on as a uh, you know I, I think a lot of people especially when they're starting out have that theory that that uh pretension of like oh i'm going to be a great man of letters or woman of letters and i'm going to be someone who just you know everyone looks up to and it's like it doesn't work like that. So you just have to make the work itself the thing you love and, you know, not really worry about that stuff. Um, easier said than done, especially when you're a pretentious, like, teenager or, you know, someone in their 20s. But um, I, I think that, you know, writing something you care about and not worrying about whether or not people are going to lodge you for it is the best thing to do. And what do you think was the best investment you ever made in building your writing career, whether that's a tool or a skill that you learned or an, an aptitude that you invested in growing? Um, you know, the best thing was just taking the time to write um, and, and not giving myself any excuses for it. Um, like when I started grad school, I was just slammed for time. And, you know, you're given these like awful, like 600 page Sir Philip Sidney books to read in like three days and stuff. But um, I just, you know, I just was like, okay, I've, I've got to get something down. I've got to get this book down and it's going to stink. But, you know, I went through it and I revised it and I sent it out and it got rejected and rejected and rejected. And like, that's all good. But that, that process of finishing it, revising it, sending it out was worth any number of courses or, or, or advice. Cause it's, it's like we were talking about with indie publishing. Like now, you know, all the processes, you know, where you start and uh, you know, and, until you, until you know what it's like to write an ending, you don't really know how to write an ending. And the first one you do is really going to stink. So you just, you know, do that. And then you're just like, ugh, don't want to do that again. And, and hopefully get better. 
<laughs> and rejection is something that comes up a lot in the writing world. And that is definitely, I think, really challenging for people to deal with when you are kind of pouring your heart and soul into something that you're so passionate about, and then you're sending it off in the world and kind of getting stomped on a little bit in the feelings. Um, I'm curious, number one, how long it took between when you started writing and when you had your first book published. How long was that? Oh, I mean, I was collecting rejections in like late high school, early college. So, and I had my first book when I was 28, 29. So like, I don't know, 15, like, you know, some of those, some of those like rejection slips, well, they're actually slips. They were paper because I submitted, like I actually mailed it. And then they're like for, for magazines that are gone now, like they've been gone for like 20 years. So yeah, like pro- probably 10 years, but it's, um, you know, it was like writing a bunch of short stories, getting a couple of acceptances, writing a novel, getting some rejections and writing another novel. Like it's just, it takes a long time, but it, it's, it's worth it. And which novel was the first one to get published? Was it like the third one you wrote or the second one or the 10th or? I mean, there was so much crap that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> when I was like, um, I I would call it basically my second book, like the second one that I I sat down, finished, and like really revised to the point of like I'm proud to show this to people. Um, you know, the first one got rejected by a bunch of publishers, but you know, one guy was like, "Oh, I like this. Send me something else," and that was like you know, just the sort of spur of like, oh, like maybe I can do this. Um, so I, I would say second, but, you know, depending on how you count, it could be like the 50th. <laughs> you were maybe a few hundred thousand words into short stories and things by the time you get to the actual novel stage. How do you think starting with like short stories and submitting and doing all that stuff impacted your ability to, to do the novel stuff? Oh, it's a tremendous help. I mean, I think short stories are, um, I mean, people always say like short stories are harder, like a great short story, like a really memorable, like a Shirley Jackson, the lottery or something like that's, that's so impossible to do. Um, but like the, the, um, but writing a bad short story is easy because it's short and you go through all the same steps as a novel. So you're writing an ending, you're writing an act two, you're revising, you're sending it out, you're getting rejections, and you're getting all that stuff on a very small um, time frame. So that when you come to the novel, it's like, oh, okay, I've done this before. I just need to do it bigger and better and with more subplots and stuff. Um, so yeah, tremendously helpful. And I, I think like short story reading is just a real it always makes me sad when people are like, oh, I don't read or write short stories because it's, it's um, some of the best writers are working in the short story vein, especially like literary writers. And um, there's some great literary magazines and it's also just, it's a great craft. You know, it's uh, it's kind of an unsung craft now, but it's, uh, it, it's super helpful. And I think you had a really interesting point that until you've written an ending, you don't know how to write an ending. And until you've written a whole story arc, you don't know what that experience is like. And writing shorter allows you to practice the whole process from start to finish in a a compact piece. So it's not like three years invested in writing your first novel and then you're ready to learn how all the pieces can really fit together because you've done each one. Um, Yeah. So that's an interesting opportunity for people to kind of get some practice, not to discount the options of short. Um, So if we bring it back, back around to crime for a minute, I am curious of all the books that you've read and all the ones that you've loved and the ones you've taught about and written. um, Do you have any sort of, let's say your top three standout examples of crime fiction, if people were going to, uh, want to read some very excellent examples of the genre if they're just getting started oh wow yeah i mean <laughs> like that's it's such a tough one because uh, i mean my my enthusiasms change but um i mean it's a very hack answer but i love raymond chandler i think that um 
you know, his, his novels and just his prose are so good. He's the first writer, I think, in crime fiction where you could, you could point to and be like, that is as good a paragraph as you're going to find anywhere else. And uh, I love his book so much that I just decided to get rid of my collected works and get another set just because I like the, the covers on this other set better. Um, so I, I would say his works, um, any of his Philip Marlowe novels, Agatha Christie, I think is great. Um, like if you're looking for, uh, someone who represents the best of the, like, like the, like the English detective series of, um, you know, like with clues where you're kind of matching wits with the detective. I mean, I think, um, and then there were none and, um, the murder of Roger Ackroyd and death in the Nile are all so great. And, uh, a, a writer that I love um, who doesn't quite get as much uh, recognition, recognition as uh, Christie is um, uh, Josephine Tay, who wrote a great series. And she wrote a book called Daughter of Time, which is, I, I still think, like the most original crime novel ever, where the main character is uh, breaks his leg and is bed bound and is looking at a painting on the wall of the... Um, Richard the Third, and he starts looking back on the Richard the Third's murder of the princes in the tower, and how history is kind of shaped by the winners, and it becomes this very weird historical crime novel. Uh, I, I it just blew me away. I love that book. Nice. That sounds very interesting. I will have to go and get my hands on that. I've not read that one before. Um, okay, so one. One last question. I think as writers, we often come from a place of readers and it's really quite cool when you sort of cross that divide onto the other side and become a writer and you get to meet all of these interesting other writers. And so I'm curious, do you have a standout moment where you met somebody who was on your bookshelf? Yeah, yes, I do. Yeah, I met... um... I met Ian Rankin and um, the the Scottish author of the Rebus series. Um, I, I met him. I've met him a couple of times. I met him at the Vancouver Writers Fest one year, and you know, at the end of the talk, people line up to ask questions, and I actually asked a question. And then later in the hall, he um, he was very nice. He's actually one of those famous people where you're like, you're too nice. Like you didn't have to be that nice to me. I would have liked you if you were a little standoffish, but like super personable. And, um, he just said, uh, remember Sam, we've all been where you are, you know, at, at that aspiring stage. And I thought that was like very classy, uh, advice and, and, uh, yeah, respect him a lot. Nice. Excellent. Well, um, that has come to the end of our time together. It flies by so very quickly. The tendency is always to make two hour long podcasts, but we all have books to write. So there are things to get back to. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking time out of your writing and teaching hours to come and talk to our listeners and watchers if they're out there on YouTube. If you aren't on YouTube, you should go check it out because Sam has an epic display of books in the background of of uh, his his Zoom window here. And uh, it gives you a nice peek into the writing cave, which is always fun. So thank you so much for coming and being part of our Strategic Authorpreneur podcast. And we look forward to checking out your next books. Where should we send people to go and find more information about you or to connect online? Uh, the latest book is called Never Going Back. If you go to samweeb.com, you can sign up for my newsletter, and there is a free uh, ebook called Hollywood North, which is a, um, a private eye story set in the uh, uh, the COVID era. So, um, yeah, please please check that out. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much. We will, of course, put the link in the show notes for Sam's website so that you can go and get your hands on that story. I am super curious to, I've not read anything yet that is set in the time of COVID. So I'm going to go and get myself on that list and get a copy so I can check that out. That sounds like an adventure. So thank you so much. And we will see you soon. Thanks so much, Crystal. 
So we're back. Uh, there were so many things that Sam uh, said uh, interview that in the interview that made me uh, think of my own uh, writing journey. Uh, there are a couple. I just want to share uh, those with you and uh, Crystal. That really made me pause. Um, and uh, at the beginning of the conversation that Sam had with Crystal, at some point uh, he was hinting at the fact that uh, he really wanted to write, uh, you know, a literary um, novel, something like uh, that. People would have said, uh, "Really, I wish somebody, I wish I had written this." Um, he used even better words. Um, he used the concept of the passion of writing to try to extrapolate what he wanted to say and wanted to do. So the passion to write drove him, drove him uh, to really write what he wanted. And uh, he said that uh, at the beginning he would set up uh, to write a literary novel, and then 10 pages in, there would be a body. And so he was like, uh, I guess uh, what I want to write is like crime fiction. And I think like that bit made the conversation even more interesting. And really, it leveled it up. Because um, when he said, I, I really guess I want to write uh, crime fiction, it's also if you turn the, uh, the head and you will see his uh, bookshelf, he, he, you will see like most of these books are crime fiction, maybe mystery, thriller. So this is one of the things that I've learned from what he said, that it was so meaningful. Uh, it's going to be easier as a writer if you write uh, in an area of passion. So these were uh, basically his words. And I completely subscribe to them. Um, in my, as you know, Crystal, in my 12 by 20 challenge, I've been trying on uh, writing different things, modern fantasy, uh, kind of urban, urbanish fantasy, science fiction, um, fairy tale, and mythological fantasy. I've been trying to write these kind of things. And then, when, while I was keeping writing, I was finding myself on being interested in writing more mythological fantasy. And so I stuck with that, basically. And now I have like four of those stories uh, out. Um, not four out of nine stories are that genre. So that's telling me something. And I really was, uh, was very happy that Sam was relating that, uh, that example of him, him trying to write a book uh, the literary one, and then just resulting in something completely different with that body in the first 10 pages, and really made me laugh, but also made me pause. That's, for me, the most important thing. Uh, make the work itself the thing you love. And uh, don't worry about being famous or to write a great you know, American novel. Really stick with, what, with something that you like, because it's the thing that you are more sure you're going to repeat in the long period. So not five days from now, but five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. And I'm using 15 because that's another number that Sam used. He said, like, if I'm thinking of when I, from when I started uh, uh, writing books, my late teenage until when I was published, that's like 15 years that it took me. So I really want to... Uh, I really want to know your opinion on that. Uh, uh, how do you think uh, writers that are listening to us, Crystal, can apply this, that I think it's a very beautiful teaching from Sam, make the work itself the thing you love? What do you think? Well, that's definitely something that comes up in the Habits book as well, is if you have something that is inherently rewarding when you do it, it is much easier to form a habit of doing it more often. And so I think when we think about our writing career or writing books, we often think in terms of a single project and not necessarily over time, but in order to actually get enough books written to establish a full-time income and make a career of it to make an actual business of it you're gonna eat breathe and sleep this stuff for years and if you are super focused and entirely dedicated and you're you know comfortable enough with your funds that you're able to actually focus on your writing right away you might 
get away with a three to five year career build. And if you're doing it part time on the side of your desk and your free time and your evenings and your weekends, you might be looking at 10 to 15 years before you make that transition because it it takes a long time to build the skills and the catalog and the knowledge to be able to actually do this stuff. And so if it's not something that you love to do, you're not going to make it for a really long time at that. And if you do, you might be able to force yourself to do it, but you're not maybe going to love it. And so that is tricky. You know, I think I've always had this rule for myself that if I was miserable more than 20% of the time, like if I was waking up in the morning and I didn't want to go to work more than two days out of 10, then I had to find myself a different job. And it, it's not different if you're a writer and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard, but it should be something that you like the challenge of and that you at least enjoy most of what you're doing or the environment you're doing it in or the people that you're working with. All of those things can go a long ways to changing it. And I, I can totally relate to what Sam said about the, you start writing something and then there's a body. For me, it's you start writing something and suddenly there's two people falling in love. Even when the book starts with a body, I always end up with a happy ending. So I totally get that. But I think it's great to do an experiment like you're doing this year, Michaela, where you just write a whole bunch of stories and you see what happens, what comes out when you just let yourself write a whole bunch of things and then look for the similar threads in those things and then find a way to tie those together. And then that is your unique sort of approach to things. So I think there's a lot of value in just recognizing um, what it is you love and letting that spill out because you're also going to connect with the people who love those books because they're you. <laughs> they're just on the other side of the screen. So that makes all your marketing efforts much more easy as well. So all of that is fantastic. Yeah, and since we kind of hinted to the subject of short stories, uh, there's also like a part of the conversation you had with him. It was like um, you were talking about short stories and the fact that uh, they're hard. <laughs> Right. Uh, and Sam says uh, that sometimes they're even harder than uh, books, like the novels. Um, but that's uh, some of uh, one of the beautiful things is that writing a bad short story is easier than a bad novel because it, it's short. And uh, so you can go through all the steps, same steps uh, as a novel. So you start it, you finish it, you revise it, um, and you ship it. And then you're starting getting rejection, so same process, uh, in a much shorter time frame. And that's, for me, it's in a way liberating. It's like something that frees me, um, that actually gives me something to think about. Because if I can fail faster and learn faster from my failure, I'll definitely take it. Um, I'm not that scared of like failing because that's part of the process. We spoke about uh, uh, that a lot, a lot of times in the podcast, and I do believe that's important for you to understand. That's a stepping stone, actually a, fa a failure. And what Sam was hinting at, I think it's important. Um, if you give yourself permission to write shorter, and you understand how a story works. Of course, a short story is going to be different from a novel because probably you're going to have one or two main characters, probably one or two locations. It depends on what kind of short story you're writing. But you definitely learn all of that process of starting, finishing, revising it, ship it out in the world. I don't, I don't know if you're legacy publishing, so you're sending it to an agent or if you are just self-publishing it and then getting rejection either in the form of the agent saying, no, I'm not interested, or bad Amazon reviews. Those are different uh, kind of form of rejection, but still they are rejection. And so writing shorter allows uh, you to experience the whole process uh, from start to finish. Um, and it's a compact piece. You can write a short story in less than a week. Even if you're writing a novella, or a novelette, you can write it in less than a month. So I will take that uh, compared to maybe the pain of trying and finishing a book or a novel 
and taking maybe one year or one year and a half or five years. So there is, for me, a misconception for writing short. And this is something that I've been learning since I started my challenge. Now I am eight and a half, basically, story in my challenge. And it is really that important. And Sam is not the first person that I'm hearing the same uh, suggestion, write short before you write longer. Neil Gaiman is another person that is suggesting doing that uh, in one of the master class that I took. It's consistent. It's something that it's repeating itself from different voice, from different people that are successful in different genres. So one of my rules is that it's like uh, if I hear the same suggestion from three to four different sources, I start paying attention. And this is really something that really made me pause and think. Uh, writing short might not uh, make your career as a writer, but it can definitely be a stepping stone on understanding what kind of writer you are. And uh, I would love to your, hear your opinion on this because I know, Krista, you two write uh, short or on the, on the shorter side, but you've been able to generate visibility and income from this kind of, let's call it strategy, if you will. What do you think of this approach? Like writing short is actually making yourself acquainted to the old process of writing yeah. well that was originally why i started with shorter stories i was having trouble finishing the longer ones and i had you know been writing for almost 20 years and just finding i couldn't get to the end of a full-length novel which was very frustrating and also i got really good at beginnings but i couldn't push past the middle part and get good at the endings as well and so for me, it was really just an opportunity. I wanted to practice the whole process from start to finish multiple times. And, you know, I didn't realize there was actually a market for that shorter fiction. But as an indie publisher, there are sections of the Kindle store specifically geared at short reads. And I had no idea that you could do that. And so I have found actually a way to monetize those learning pieces. And they're also, they're, as you're starting out, they're faster to publish, they are quicker to get edited, they are cheaper to get edited, they're quicker and cheaper to turn into audiobooks. So I actually used my short stuff as a way to learn all the different parts of the publishing industry and really perfect my process in a shorter period of time. So I actually was able to write and release um, eight novellas and short stories in about an eight month period. And so that was me really testing out what happened when you rapid release and the mo looking at the momentum I could build. And I found I, I got about 6,000 uh, mailing list subscribers and I was able to make about 20 grand off of a series of shorter stories that normally wouldn't have maybe even had a market. So I think there's some room to play in there and it can be a way to generate enough products that then you have things to give away to get people on your mailing list and you can turn all those early efforts into other things when you have longer pieces or if you have longer pieces you can box set them you can do all kinds of cool stuff so I'm definitely a big fan of writing short and I think it's a great way to jumpstart your skills and also to get yourself established in a market and do some testing if you're not sure who your audience is going to be if you can fire out a bunch of shorter pieces and see which ones do people love which are the ones that people are asking for more of which ones did you love writing and then find the happy ground in the middle of those things where your audience is happy and you're still having fun writing them and you know you've built up a consistent pattern of writing and releasing and it's much easier to then make that leap into writing as a career when it's something that you've really ironed out all the bugs already so yeah and uh was like one very last thing that i thought it was very interesting uh so sam is teaching also on um uh, or say semester based, so he's teaching consistently. And there was one thing that he said. Uh, the one of the things that he notices the most um, when writers uh, ask him questions uh, is that uh, most of them they have very interesting life experiences. The problem is that 
they are not able to translate them into dramatic terms. Uh, and this is one of the most important things that I think he said in the whole interview. And I think like the answer is because that's craft and that takes time to master. It doesn't matter if you are like, you know, um, even if you are very smart, it's like really something that you have to spend time into understanding the craft of writing, which is so much different from anything else. And I would say like even very smart, intelligent people, you can't uh, really find your way out of it if not just spending hours. It's really something that you have to build. It's like a muscle, really. You can be super smart and stuff, but you have to go through the same process that other people went through in order to build up really a craft and making sure that that uh, experience really translates into a drum, in drum, into believable, relatable, dramatic terms. And I think this is a, one of the things that I'm struggling the most because really I've been writing consistently in English, my second language, for a couple of years now. It is hard to convey what's inside here my mind in my head and i think uh, it's important for you to understand as sam said that even people and authors that are very successful they have been exactly in the same spot that you are at now in this very moment so i think it's important for us crystal to underline this it's a question of it's like a marathon it's not a sprint i know we said this more than once but I think like this interview with uh, Sam was another occasion to reiterate that important uh, concept that you have to put in the writing time. What do you think about that? Yes, absolutely. There is no shortcut except to do it. <laughs> that is the only shortcut. You can cut some time off of things by not procrastinating and putting your butt in the chair and doing the hard work for sure. Now, we are going to dig into the curious jar and find ourselves a question for today because we are gluttons for punishment. And if you have a question you want to add to the jar, you can email it to ideas at strategic and we will put it on a colored paper and add it into the mix. So, what one should I stop on? Stop now. Oh, orange today. Okay, let's see here. Ooh, okay. If you could learn to speak one language overnight, what language would it be? Yeah, I think I have the answer. Um, it's um. ASL, and I think it's because, okay, long story short, I took like a, uh, I think it was a 10 weeks uh, long ASL class for very basic kind of stuff, and I really loved it. Um, but I wasn't able to really go over the point of like just spelling my name and saying, this is my name, I, I'm... I'm okay, you're okay, well, you're, it's like really the basic. What I really found interesting of this language, that much that I tried to write a story, I write a story about it. Of course, it's a mythological story. So, uh, But there, there was a concept of uh, a language based on signs that you really have to pay attention to the face of the person to understand when something is stressed, for example. Uh, because if you're doing something like, uh, you can see me, if, if you're not on YouTube, you're not going to see it. So, uh, but if I do this, it means hot. But if I do like, that means uh, very hot. And I, I know you can see me if you're not on, on YouTube, but what I'm trying to say is that you have to pay really attention. You have to be focused on the, the, the person that is on the other side. And this is something that I've never seen in any other language. And I am speaking Italian, in English, more or less I can speak. You can see that. Um, Spanish a bit. Uh, I know just a bit enough the, in Japanese to be dangerous uh, at times. But really, sign language was like uh, it was like stepping on an alien planet and learning a completely different skill set. Uh, 
and it's nowhere close to anywhere I ever tried when I was trying and learning all these languages. So I would say AS, a, uh, American Sign Language would be my, my, my choice, and that's the reason why. <laughs> what, what, what about you, <laughs> Crystal? Interestingly, that is also my first choice. Um, I think I've always wanted to learn more ASL. I know only a small amount. Again, I you know communicated with kids that I worked with and also with friends growing up in my school, but I never really got what I would consider a fully fluent version. And actually, when I was young, I got really bad ear infections and I lost my hearing over a period of about a year. And um, my mom actually didn't notice because she never speaks to people unless she's facing them. And I had learned to lip read as I was losing my hearing. And I remember, I just, I remember being not able to hear things and the way that that felt really isolating. And I feel strongly that I would um, a be at pretty big risk of losing my hearing again in the future. So that's something that I think personally is relevant, that it just makes sense to learn that, but also um, just wanting to be able to make poetry with your hands. I think it's really interesting to see language expressed outside our body and outside our mouths in a visual way is really, really interesting. Um, so I, yeah, I would love that and to be able to connect with other people as well. I mean, the list of languages I want to learn is very long. I clearly need to take a little more action in these directions. Um, but I would love to be better at Spanish. I would love to learn Japanese, Chinese, um, Italian, German, really anything that has a really different language root, I think is fascinating because you learn a lot about people's culture when it comes to their language. And I had Irish would be another one that I would like because that is, I learned bits and pieces from the kids that I lived with in Ireland because they were going to school in Irish classes and they would come home and teach me some words. Um, and I, you know, to read signs and things when I lived there, but it was uh, definitely a really interesting, beautiful language that I think isn't being preserved either. So there's lots, but uh, definitely, ASL still comes out at the top for me. And please remember for show notes, links to resources that we mentioned, and for coupons and discounts on the tools we love, please visit us at strategicentrepreneur.com and join our mailing list. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on any of the different platforms this post podcast is, please make sure to review, let us know what you think of it. We're again relatively new podcast wise, and we would love to hear what you think of us. Thank you very much. And be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast so you don't miss out on our next episode because we are going to be digging into virtual conferences. So now that everything is online and looking like it's going to stay that way for a while, we are going to help you try to get the most out of any online conference experience you have. So we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the tips, tricks, and hacks we've developed over the last few months as we've been attending and presenting at some ourselves. So until next week, happy writing, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. What a, what a okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but Canadian. But, okay. Okay. Okie dokie. Stop drinking, you make me thirsty. <laughs> Let's not waste time. Then. Why am I wasting time? Let's go. <laughs> Last time it's possible that my microphone wasn't actually working properly. So when the sound was a little different, oh, that could probably, be why. Uh, probably something so. <laughs> <laughs> but